Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Easter to everybody, yes. We should never forget, like we just were talking a few seconds ago, what Jesus has done for us. And we don't know the half of it. We only know what's recorded. You know, we don't know the half of it. And I was asking... God, this week when I was uh, when I found out I was doing service, which way He wanted me to go. There are many ways, many things we can say about Easter. We can talk about His resurrection and how you know through His resurrection we have gotten life. We can talk about the suffering He went through. But God brought me to John three sixteen, the passage we all know. We'll reach 16 to 19, and we'll start off there and see where he leads us. Because he's in control of this service. I'm not. His Holy Spirit has free range to do whatever he wants. And I don't know if you can feel his presence, but I do. And I thank you, Lord God, for being here with us this morning. I pray, Lord God, that your word would touch our hearts, that you would teach us, Lord God, use my mouth, Lord God, to teach us, Lord God. We all need to hear from you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Now, John 3.16 is a verse that everybody knows. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believe on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, God sent Jesus for the world. He didn't send Jesus for the church, for the world. And the things that Jesus did on the cross was a gift to the whole world. Jesus uh, forgave, he became the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And because of this, anyone, not just favorite, but anyone can come to him and receive him and receive the gift of life. Now, here it says that whosoever believes on him shall not perish. So this gift that God gave us through Jesus can only be acquired by faith. You are not saved because your parents are saved. You are not saved because you go to church. You can come to church every day of your every day that it's open and still not be saved. You are saved because you believe in him. A lot of people coming to church is just a thing to do on Sunday. But God is looking for people who believe in him. People who are willing to be used by him. When a church is only there because it's Sunday, then there's no glory for God in that church. So it says, whoever shall believe on him will not perish but have eternal life. Now verse 17 to me is as, as important, if not more important, than verse 16. Yet verse 16 is the one verse that everybody you know, lifts us up. But it says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But, by, but that the world through him might be saved or made whole. The word save here means to be made whole, to, to come back to the nature of God, to be holy as he is holy. Now, the reason I say this verse is important is because over the years I've seen over and over how Christians use the cross to condemn the world. Because they'll go to, to somebody who is not saved and saying, you're going to hell because you don't believe in Jesus. And because you refuse Jesus, you're going to hell. And they're using the cross to condemn somebody. But God says, I didn't send my son to condemn the world. 
I send my son to save the world. And sometimes we think that somebody should accept Jesus because we accepted them. At the time, we think they should accept them. But the Bible says that only God knows the time. The Bible says that God has to draw people unto him. Our job is to be a light. Our job is to live the life that God has asked us to live. To become a light so that people can see what living for God is all about. And then let God work in their heart. The Bible tells us that Jesus was the friend of sinners. He was accused by the Pharisees to be the friend of sinners. Well, he wasn't the friend of sinners because he condemned them all the time. He was a friend of sinners because he loved them. Because he spent time with them. Because he answered their question without compromising his belief. You see, we're not supposed to, to join the world and become like them. No, we're supposed to be what God asks us to be. But we're not supposed to play God. We are not supposed to decide who gets saved and when and who goes to hell and when. Because I'm going to tell you, on the day of judgment, we will be surprised who makes it to heaven and who doesn't. And who's in hell and who isn't. Because God has set so many things. The Bible says that God doesn't want nobody to perish. And, and the, the church is quick to say that if you don't do it my way, you're damned to hell. No, God can work on that person's heart and at the last breath on his deathbed, he can cry out to God and he'll be there. He may live a whole life sinning and doing things that you think he should be, shouldn't be doing. But cry to God on their last breath and be saved. We are not to judge anybody. God did not send his son to condemn the world, but to love them, to give them life. And that is our job as a Christian too. You don't do God any favors when you start pointing fingers. And you got to be careful because some, some Christians have pushed people away. Sometimes God is working on the heart of somebody and some Christians are, have pushed people away. Because of things they said. Things that they had no right to say. I think of somebody that I know. That maybe some of you guys know about this too. He's a Christian today. But he's, he has struggled a lot. Because one day when he was at church camp. And he went up to pray. This guy told him. says, There's no hope for you. You've done the unpardonable sin. And that guy went away destroyed. Now, who made that pastor or that person God? Only God can dis decide who will and who will not make it. It is not up to us. God has called us to love people, not to judge them. We may not like what they do, but we have still have to love them. We may not agree with what they do, and we still have to love them. So God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But that through him, the world might be saved. And God is not willing that any perish. And he will do everything he can to bring somebody in. But he can't bring everybody in. Because God gave us free will. He will allow us to choose. Now it says in verse 18, But he that believes on who has faith to receive him, is not condemned. But he that believes not, who receives him not by faith, is condemned already. He that, uh, he has not believed, because he has not believed in the name of the uh, only begotten Son of God. And it says, and this is the condemnation that is in the world, that light has come into the world, but man have love or has chosen darkness rather than light, because deeds are evil. God says this is when condemnation comes in. When you willingly choose darkness over light, it is a choice. If God's working on somebody's heart, there will come a day where God's going to tell him you have to make a decision. 
God will take the time it needs to show himself to that person. Take the time it needs to show him the proper way. But there comes a time that God says, now is the time. You know? And God will, we, and God is different with everybody. We can't say God will give you one chance. We can't say God will give you two chances. We don't know. But there comes a time when God says, enough is enough. And that's because you have chosen darkness over light. And we got to get, uh, some Christians believe that once you're saved, everything is okay. And you don't have to worry anymore. And that's because of the grace movement, because of, you know, the uh, people who speak about God grace and only about God grace. Well, there's more in the Bible than just God's grace. Yes, there is grace. But even Paul himself says, you know, when it comes to me, I make sure that, that I'm doing the right thing. I make sure that, that at the end, I don't get disqualified. That, you know, I gave you the stuff to get saved, but eventually I stand before God and God says, I'm sorry. You know, you didn't listen to me. I'm sorry, you did your own thing. So just because you got saved doesn't mean that now you can relax. You have to read your word. You have to remind yourself of what God expects out of you. You have to pray to get strength. I mean, even though your spirit is willing, Jesus said the flesh is weak. We are carnal after all. And we can easily be influenced. Now, this plan that God had to send his son, I've heard Christians along the way, like in many Christians I've heard on TV and people I've talked to, that for some reason they have this mindset that Jesus was God's plan C. That God wanted a holy people, and he first started with, Abraham, with Adam, sorry, plan A, Adam. He made him holy, and he told him, don't eat from that tree. All Adam had to do was, listen, you can have every other three, tree, you can do anything else, just don't touch that tree. And, and, and that was God's plan A. And, and they say, you know, Adam was stupid, I don't know why he did it, it should have been so sim simple. He did it because he was carnal. He did it because that tree spoke to him as loud as God had spoken to him. But the thing is that they said that was plan A. But Satan came into the garden. And Satan deceived Adam and Eve. And he stole man from God. I've never heard something so stupid, but that's what some people believe. That Satan is that powerful. That he was able to destroy God's plan. So God came up with plan B. He came up with the law. So now people could have salvation. He could have life if they only obeyed the law. But there was another problem. Man was not willing to obey the law. So God is still left without a people. And he wants a people. Plan A didn't work. Plan B didn't work. So here comes plan C, Jesus. And through plan C, God achieved what he wanted to do. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches us. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, we find that Jesus dying on the cross was not plan C. It was actually plan A from the beginning. That all these other things happened so we could get to Jesus. That it wasn't, you know, Satan overpowering God or tricking God. Or In Ephesians 1, chapter 4 and 5 says, According that he has chosen us unto him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame in love, having predestinated us. Now, he's still talking before the foundation of the world here. Having predestinated us before the foundation of the world, Unto adoption of children by Jesus Christ himself, according to his good pleasure of his will. So it says here that before the foundation of the world, God had already decided that he would redeem the world through Jesus. Now, if you take a minute, a minute and think about this, this verse tells us a lot. 
this verse tells and should make us think differently about a lot of things. That's before Adam and Eve were ever created. That's before they ever sinned. That's before Satan even fell. Because Satan was created perfect, just like Adam and Eve. The Bible says in, in Isaiah and in Ezekiel that Satan was created perfect. And he remained perfect until iniquity was found in him. Now what was his, his iniquity? He wanted to exalt himself to the level of God. He didn't want to take God over. I don't think he's that stupid to think that he could take God over. He wanted to bring himself to the level of God. But the problem was that he was perfect, but somehow iniquity ended up in him. And iniquity means sin. It means to have decided to go against what God has expected of you. Now, a transgression of any law is a sin, which is an iniquity. That means that Satan had something called free will. God gave Satan free will just like he gave mankind free will. And free will means you have at least two choices. You cannot have free will if you only have one choice. You have to have at least two choices. And God gave us two choices. Now, many Christians will tell you that choice number one is God and choice number two is Satan. That's not true. Because Satan fell to iniquity just like Adam did. Choice number one is God. God says you can do it my way. You can follow my leading. That is choice number one. But choice number two is self, is doing it your way. And in order for God to give us this second choice, he had to create what we call the carnal nature. That is a self-seeking, self-gratifying nature that seeks to exalt self at any cost. That's what Satan fell to, wanting to exalt himself above all others, and being equal to God. And that's what he created man with. Some people believe that the carnal nature came as a result of Adam's fall. No. It would have been impossible for Adam to fall if he didn't have the carnal nature. The carnal nature gave him choice number two. The carnal nature gave him the choice of eating that, uh, going against God and eating that fruit. God created man as a spirit, but he put him in a carnal shell where the, the body interacts with this world and what this world has to offer. And, and the Bible tells us that this world has been created with three forces that are at work with us all, uh, against us all the time. That's causing us to want to become self-seeking and self-gratifying. It's in 1 John chapter uh, 2 verse 15 to 17, I think. God says, love not this world, neither the things that are in this world. For whoever loves this world, now the word love here means to become one with, to associate yourself with. For whoever loves this world cannot love God. God says you can't serve two masters. You can either serve this world or serve him. Satan is not a choice here. Satan will entice you to to. To love this world. Because he wants you to lose out just like he lose out. Now we have a proof of this. In uh, Genesis chapter 3 verse 6. This is talking about. When the serpent came to tempt Eve. The serpent came in. And tempted Eve with one thing. To make herself to the level of God. The same thing he fell at. He didn't talk about anything else. He came in and he says. Did God tell you you can't eat that fruit? Well he told us that we shouldn't eat it. And we shouldn't touch it. Which is not true. God didn't say that. But that only proves that Eve's information came from Adam. Didn't come from God. See God spoke to Adam. Way before Eve was ever created. God told Adam, do not touch this tree. Uh, do not eat from this tree. He didn't say don't touch. He said, do not eat from this tree. 
Eve came along after, and, and Adam was the one who educated Eve on what God had said. And for some reason, he had said, don't look, at, don't touch it, don't look it, don't eat it, don't do nothing with it. That's why the Bible tells us that Eve was deceived and Adam wasn't. Because Adam had heard from God, he knew what God wanted, Eve had heard from Adam. And that's why she was deceived. That's why Satan couldn't manipulate her. Because she hadn't heard from God. Because his first question to Eve was, did God really say? And she couldn't say yes or no. She wasn't there. Adam told her. She says, well, we're not supposed to touch it. and We're not supposed to eat it. And, and Satan slides in. And actually, he told her the truth. He deceived her with the truth. But it's a twisted truth. You know, He said to her, he says, you won't die if you eat it. Because she probably thought, you know, Physical death. She probably thought, the end of me, I'm, I'm done with. He says, you're, you're not going to die if you eat that fruit. God knows in the day you'll eat it, you'll become like him to know good and evil. And the Bible says, I believe it's, uh, it's in verse 27, it says, man has become one of us to know good and evil. Satan told her the truth. But he said, you will not die. Now, he, when, G, when God spoke of death, he didn't speak of physical death. He didn't speak of spiritual death. Some people say they died spiritually. No, these, they remained spiritual creatures anyway. What died was the relationship between God and Adam. They lost the intimacy, 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 intimacy that they, he, they shared with him. So Eve, being deceived, took of the fruit and ate it. Now, I believe, and it says that right after that, she gave to Adam and he ate it. Now, Adam had heard from God. But through Eve's deception, he was also deceived in a way because when he looked at Eve and nothing happened after she ate the fruit, because nothing happened after she ate the fruit. She took the fruit, nothing happened. The Bible just says and she turned around and gave it to Adam. There was no lightning. There was no eyes being opened. There was no, nothing happened because she had been deceived. So she turned around and she gives it to Adam. And I'm sure Adam looked at her. Nothing happened. God said that we would die. You know? And he took and he ate it too. But his act was an act of rebellion because he knew he had heard from God not to touch it. And that's why he's credited with the sin and not Eve. But in, in uh, Genesis 3, uh, verse 6, it says that before Satan had already come, Eve had already been looking at the fruit. And the fruit had been speaking to her. Because it says when she saw that the fruit was pleasant to the eyes. And it was good for food. We have the lust of the flesh and we've got the lust of the eyes here. The imagination, how, how good this fruit would be. Her imagination was going. And it was pleasant to the eyes. It appealed to her. It spoke to her. And on top of that, now he would make her wise, which is what Satan offered her. She took it. This is proof that the carnal nature was active before the fall of man. And it would have been impossible, like I say, for Adam and Eve to sin unless they had a choice. And God gave them a choice. Now, I started thinking to myself... It's kind of strange that God knew that Adam and Eve would sin, that knew the law wouldn't work, yet he still went through those steps anyway. He knew that Jesus was the answer because it says before the foundation of the world, he would redeem the world through Jesus. He knew that was the answer. That was the end plan, that the end game, I mean. And yet he allowed all these things to come true. To come to pass before. I mean. It's even. It's almost like God wanted certain things to happen. So we could get to Jesus. Because when it comes to Adam and Eve. Yes we talk about Satan coming into the garden. And tempting Adam and Eve. But we forget that God created the tree. We forget that God made it forbidden. 
We forget that God made its fruit appealing. We forget that God planted that tree right beside the tree of life where Adam and Eve would have to interact with it on every day. He could put, he could have made the fruit so ugly and so smelly and uh, that nobody would approach it. He could have put it in the corner of the garden somewhere covered with thorns to make sure that nobody ever approach it. But God wanted Adam to have a choice. And he did all these things. Now, the reason he wanted people to have free will is because God does not want robots worshiping him. He wants people who will worship him in spirit and in truth, from the heart and in all honesty. That's, all, that's why we were talking about earlier that you know, when we come to church, we should come for God and we should worship him from the heart. That's what he seeks for. So, God's plan has always been to have a people who are holy. That's what we read in Ephesians earlier. Who are holy, without blame, and that walk in love. That's already been God's, always been God's plan. But God knew that if he wanted a people who did that from the heart, he needed to give them free will. And to give them free will means that sin will occur. Especially when you have a flesh like ours that speaks to us all the time. I mean, even us as Christians, we still fail. And we have the Holy Spirit in us. And the Holy Spirit speaks to us and guides us, and we still fail. So what chance does the world have that doesn't have the voice of God within them talking to them? I mean, the only chance or the only uh, voice that they have in them is the voice of morality that their parents gave them growing up. And if they happen to grow up with bad parents, they don't have a good voice inside of them. So God knew it's going to happen. And God knew what making somebody carnal meant. It meant that we seek for me, myself, and I. So God expected Adam and Eve to fail. But Jesus was the end game. Adam and Eve was not the, the plan of God. To, to have a people that be holy from them. God knew they would fail. And if they wouldn't fail, somebody along the way would fail and there would be a need for a redeemer. But the flesh, the carnal flesh, also tells us, we don't need anybody. I can do it myself. I can do it myself. I mean, you can see that in, even in little kids. Like, you know, I can do it. I can do it. And, you know, they want to move something that's 10 times their size. But I can do it. They'll try. Because that's the flesh. That's carnality. And God knew that. So God came out with the law. Because he had to teach man that on your own, you can't do it. So he came out with the law. And the law basically was, you keep yourself holy. And when you do a mistake, bring a lamb, bring something, you know, and we'll sacrifice it. It will forgive your sin, but it's up to you to stay holy. And that was the law. But Paul says the law was a schoolmaster. The law was put in place to teach us something. And the message that the law gave man is, I can't do it on my own. I'm constantly having to bring lambs and goats and, and sheep to be offered in sacrifice because I'm constantly in a mess. I can't live, I can't walk this way by myself. So God used the law as a schoolmaster. The law was not God's plan, plan B. God did not say, okay, I'm going to put everything you know, in this. And, and the law and, and the covenant that he made, there was nothing wrong with that covenant. If man was able to keep the law, then it would have worked. But man was unable to keep the law because the problem with the law is that there's a curse attached to it. And that's actually what Jesus came to save us from. I hear people sometimes say, Jesus came to, you know, to forgive my sin. 
Yes, you do get forgiveness of sin through what he did, but, but Jesus came to redeem us from the curse of the law, the Bible says. He came to save us from that curse. There is a curse of the law. And the curse of the law is plain and simple. The minute you sin, all your righteousness is wiped away. Making it impossible to you ever have an intimate relationship with God. Because if you're unholy, you can't have it in a relationship with him. We have to be holy as the Father is holy, as uh, he is holy. So, the law would have worked if there was no curse attached to it. If we could if we could sin and not lose our connection with God, it would have been fine. But the law was Instantaneously, as you sin, that connection was ruptured. But the law was only there to teach man that you can't do it on your own. The law was only there to, to teach man that if you try to reach God with your own effort, you will never get there. Because God is way up there and you're way down here. So now we come to the real plan of God where he puts a mediator between man and God. Man cannot reach God by themselves, but by faith they can reach God through Jesus Christ. And it's done by faith. That's what we said that the, the Bible says, whoever shall believe on him will not perish. But we do it by faith. Now for that to happen, God... See, the covenant was between God and man. And God had to have the new covenant between God and man again. Because it was to affect mankind. So the only way that could happen is that Jesus had to come as a man. He had to come as a man. He had to keep himself holy. And he had to become the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And that speaks of... The Day of Atonement. Now, God had a, a established many different rituals and many different things when the law was in place. And one of the rituals they did is on a specific day, the priest would go in and offer sacrifice. And uh, it was different types of sacrifice, but it was also lambs and wolves and stuff. But these sacrifices was to cover the sins of the people. The sins that were committed in ignorance, the, the sins that people never you know, realized that they had committed. Because, see, the curse of the law worked whether you realize you had sinned or not. A sin takes place whether you realize it or not. If I'm driving down the highway 80 kilometers an hour in a 50 kilometer zone, the police will not stop me because I didn't do nothing wrong. They stop me because I broke the law. I am guilty in the eyes of the police. Whether I know it or not, I can tell them I never saw the sign. I never seen that I was supposed to own it. It doesn't matter. You broke the law. And it's the same thing with God. And the curse of the law worked whether you knew it or not. Whether you, uh, you knew that you had sin or not. You know, sometimes we hurt people, we don't even know it. Sometimes we say things to people and we hurt them, we don't even know it. You know? And the Passover, uh, not Passover, yeah, the, uh, the, the sacrifice of atonement was done to cover those sins. And that's what Jesus came to do. His death on the cross covered everybody's sin that was done in ignorance so that everybody could start at the same place. After that, we're still responsible for our sins. We don't offer sacrifices anymore, but if we sin, we are required to repent. You don't act like it's nothing wrong. You know? Yeah, and God wants a sincere repentance too. He doesn't want, oh, I'm sorry, Lord. No, that's not what he wants. He wants a sincere repentance. So God, to bring man to him, needed a mediator. Somebody that a mediator is a, a go-between, they say. Somebody that represents you. Jesus came to represent mankind. And before that, God's contract was, you know, with individuals. 
Now God's covenant is with Jesus as the representative of mankind. Okay? Now the problem with covenant is that they're only good if both parties keep what they're supposed to do. You know, if you have a if you have a a covenant with somebody, well, the minute one person breaks the covenant, it's over. If the covenant's gone, and that was what happened with the first covenant, the first covenant was made through the law, and it was broken all the time. So God says, "I'm going to make a new covenant, build on better promises." And I'm going to put Jesus as the mediator. So Jesus came as a man. So he could represent man. And he suffered and he died as the Lamb of God. That takes away the sins of the world. As the atonement sacrifice. And now through Jesus by faith. We can be just. Now the difference between. What we, what we have through Jesus and what was through the law is like I said earlier, the minute you sin, the relationship was ruptured. But now God's, God's contract or God's agreement is with Jesus. And he never sinned. So the curse of the law does not apply to him. And by faith we can go through him to God. And the curse of the law does not apply to us anymore. Which means that when we do sin, we don't lose God's intimacy. God is still present with us. And he will lead us to repentance. He will lead us to a place where we can get better and better. Because God knows that you're not going to become holy in one day. Because your flesh will tug on you. I mean, just look at Paul's description of the struggle he had in Romans chapter 7. He says, the things I don't want to do, I always end up doing. The things that I should do, I never do. He says, who's going to deliver me from this body of death? And Paul says, I, you know, I realize something. Uh, you know, as he matures in God, he realizes my heart wants to follow God and wants to serve God. But my flesh wants to serve sin. And he says, I realize that wherever I go, whenever I intend to do good, bad always follows me. And, and eventually, sometimes I do fall. I do choose to do the wrong thing. I do choose to obey the flesh rather than obey the spirit of God that is within my heart. You know, <clears throat> but God says that if because of Jesus, because of the mediator we have, and because Jesus has destroyed or redeemed us from the curse of the law, when we do fail, we don't lose God's presence anymore. We can be God's people, and all we have to do is repent, get up, and continue. And we learn as we go, like I said. You know, usually a child doesn't listen to you the first time you tell them. You know, I mean, and you can see the, the carnal nature active in a child before they even know what a sin is. I mean, you put a cookie on the counter, that cookie's going to disappear. You might tell them, don't touch the cookie, but that cookie will disappear. Because why? Because the flesh wants it. You know, or, you know, they, they, they'll make little tantrums and they want their way. And that's all the flesh. And it's the same in our walk with God. God expects us to fall and God expects us to, to hurt ourselves. And God will allow us to go through certain things just so we can learn a lesson or two. And, you know, and we grow and we mature. And, but in the meantime, we don't lose our connection with him. Because we have a mediator between God and us. Someone that has conquered death in the grave someone that has redeemed us from the curse of the law but it's only true faith if you don't believe in jesus then you're on your own again because jesus is only the mediator of those who believe in him and it's true faith that we are saved not by works of our own you can try as much as you can the Bible says that all of our works are as filthy rags before God because all of our works are co-mingled with the flesh. But only Jesus became the perfect sacrifice. Now, over the years, people have always tried to figure God and say, well, this is what he's doing now and this is what he's doing now. And as I was doing the study last night, God was telling me, like, you know, 
people don't understand that I do. Th I know the end from the beginning. And I, I, and I started at the end. I, the first thing I decided was I was redeeming the world through Jesus. That's the first thing I decided. That's my end game. But that's what I decided first. You know, and, and sometimes people are, you know, try to say, well, God's doing this now and God's doing that. And the Bible clearly tells us that our ways are not his ways. We can't figure God with our mind. And our thoughts are not his thoughts. The only revelations we've got of, of God is what the Holy Spirit gives us. And God had said that the new covenant would be built on better promises. And the better promise was that the Holy Spirit would again be restored unto his people. Because when Adam was created, God had breathed a spirit in, inside of him. That was Adam's connection to God. That was Adam's connection to God. And when we get saved, the Holy Spirit comes back into us. And that he becomes our connection to God. And you know what? And now in the times that when you do something wrong, you're not left on your own anymore. You've got that voice of the Holy Spirit that tells you, yeah, it was wrong what you did, but God still loves you. Just repent and just do your best not to do it again. And the intimacy is never lost. We never lose that the Holy Spirit. God says, I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. Now, we may leave him. We can quench the spirit. It's not because the spirit is gone. It's because we turn the volume down. We can grieve the spirit, but he's not going to leave you because he's one of the better promises of God. He's the life that, that God wanted us to have from the beginning. But now God has a people who worship him by choice. By faith in Jesus Christ, they have made a commitment, an agreement with God to worship him, to be his people. And it's come from the heart. It's not because there's a tree here there that you shouldn't touch. It's not because there's a law here that says something. It's from the heart. And that's what God wanted from the beginning. Is people who would worship him in spirit and in truth. People who would do it from the heart. In all honesty. You know, when I screw up, I come to God and say, God, I screwed up again. I'm not trying to justify myself. I, I'm not going to blame anybody else. This is my fault, Lord. I'm to blame. And that's the kind of people God wants. And we are all on the road to perfection. Paul says, Let's go on the road to perfection. And you know, the amazing thing when you read in, in the Bible, you see Paul and you see Paul's growth. But even at the end of his life, he says, you know what? I have not attained where I think I should be. But thank God there's a place for me in heaven. You know, some people think you have to be perfect to go to heaven. No. All you need to go to heaven is faith in Jesus Christ. And then you do your best to, to get as perfect as you can be. But all you need is faith. You don't need to, to never break a law. You don't need to, to uh, you know, uh, have no temptations around you. You just need to live your life for God to the best you can. And when you do screw up, you ask forgiveness and you believe in the in the sacrifice that Jesus did for you. You receive that forgiveness and you keep on going. And don't ever quench that voice of the Spirit. It's your lifeline. I mean, Jesus himself said to, to his, his disciple, it is very important that I depart from you. He says, because if I don't leave, the Spirit can't come. But Jesus knew that he could only do go so far with, the, with his disciples. He could teach them you know, what God expected. He could do those things, but he was not on the inside. He was not a voice of guidance. He says it's important that the Spirit comes. Because when He comes, He will lead you. Don't ever make somebody feel that they have to be perfect for God to love them. They don't. All they have to do is receive the gift that Jesus gave them, believe in Him, and do their best. And some will do better than others in this life. But we're all going to end up to heaven if we just believe in Him. You know? And... 
I, there's a proverb that says we should never judge a person unless we walked a mile in their shoes, you know. And that is true because sometimes me and Brenda, lots of times we, we watch shows on TV. We like to watch like American Idol and The Voice and stuff like that. And you look at the person when they first come out and you don't know what kind of life they live. And then they start telling their story. And we say, you know, that person had a hard life, like, you know, or went through a hard thing. And, and, and we don't know. So we can't judge. You know, we can only love. And that's what God has called us to do is to love. But God, uh, but Jesus was not God's plan C. The law and, uh, and the forbidden tree and everything were all things that God put in place to bring us to Jesus. So that carnal man can understand that on their own, they can't do it. That they need the Spirit of God. And it is by faith that we are saved, not by works of ourselves. And I thank Jesus for what he did because, like I said this morning when we were looking at a bit of the passion of the Christ when he was being whipped. And when, I would have quit a long time ago. I think I would have quit before they even hit me with the first one. <laughs> you know? And the thing I, that I was thinking about this this week, and the thing I realized that, you know, it's one thing to go through something hard, but not know, not know that it's coming. It's another thing to know that it's coming. It's been prophesied. It's been written down through ages. And you know what's coming and you know what's going to happen to you. As a man, I'd rather not know when something happened to me than know ahead of time and something happened to me. And that's why Jesus didn't want that cup. It troubled him. And it started troubling him way before he got to the cross. I mean, you could see how Satan was speaking to his mind when, when Peter came to him and says, you know, you don't have to die, Jesus. We'll fight for you and we'll deliver you. And, he, and then Jesus looked at Peter and says, get thee behind me, Satan. He wasn't talking to Peter as, he wasn't calling Peter Satan, but Satan was speaking to him in his mind. You know, telling him, you don't have to do God's will. You don't have to, you know. And so, and then when, they, when the time really came, he went three times begging God to change his mind. Because he knew what was coming. He knew there was nails coming in his hands and in his feet. He knew there was a crown of thorns coming. That he would be whipped beyond recognition. And he didn't want that. But he did it for us. So anyway, all you need, you know, there's a song, I think the Beatles sings, all you need is love. Well, the reality is all you need is faith. All you need is faith in God and Jesus Christ and, and everything's going to be okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, we'll uh, we'll pass for the uh, offering in a few seconds. But uh, anyway, that's what God had on my heart for today, and I hope uh, I explained it. Uh, I only had a few a few days to get ready between everything else, but uh, uh, I hope that uh, you understood what I was trying to say. That you know that God is in control. God has never lost control. I mean, I, I will end with this that God showed me yesterday. Well, I, he showed me before, but he reminded me yesterday. In Isaiah 45, God says, I am God and there is no other. I created the light and, and allowed or permitted the darkness. He says, nothing happens that I don't want it to happen, but everything happens for a reason. And sometimes things that happen are not some things we enjoy or want. But there's a reason somewhere, and just trust me. Because he says, I am God, and there is no other. Satan is not a thorn in God's side. God could have got rid of Satan when he revolted. The Bible says that when he revolted, you know, that those that joined with him were sent to the pit. But God said, you are not going to join them. He kept them out of the pit because he plays a part in God's plan. To bring people to the cross. To bring people to Jesus. God is in control. There's a song like that. I think it's Twyla Paris that sings that. That God is in control. You know, we don't have to worry about anything. Just trust him and believe in him. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll pick up uh, the offering in a few seconds.